Viewers of my channel know that I've built a number of road cases for vintage brass instruments, and this is another one. Um, I don't really know why I made this one other than I had shown parts of the making of it in a couple other videos I did very recently, just in passing, and I had a few comments from people saying they would really like to see the rest of the case building, so since I had taken photos step by step of the process for my own records, I decided to go ahead and just make a narrated slideshow of it. This is the instrument in question. This is a Civil War vintage over the shoulder uh, sax horn in the tenor pitch. That's a B flat tenor. And uh, I think I have probably two or three other videos of this of cases of this same style instrument in various different sizes, larger and smaller than this. Um, but here we go. Let's go through this one in detail. As usual, I sketch up my ideas for the case. Now I've built cases of the same design before with minor variations, so I already knew pretty much what I was going to do. I try to keep the case as small as possible while still having a certain amount of space on all sides of the instrument and uh, satisfying some other requirements. And uh, so the case is still fairly large, but it, I try to minimize how large it is given the uh, constraints of the design. As usual, this case is a semi-monocoque design, so some of the strength is in a light framework and a lot of the strength is in the, the skin of the case. And as usual, I start with some select pine boards I buy at Home Depot. Now they call these 2 inch by 2 inch, but they're really a bit smaller than 2 inch by 2 inch. Um, I actually don't know what it is offhand. I think it's pretty close to 1 and a half inches, maybe 1 and 5 eighths uh, on each side. But um, anyway, these are 8 foot lengths here. I use my table saw to rip these down to 1 and a quarter inch uh, square and uh, the three of them are laying on the floor here and behind those are the thin strips that were cut off. I used three of these to make the framework and I had a fourth length which was not shown in the previous video which I bought just to cover sundry details like some reinforcements for hinges and latches and uh, other bits and pieces of wood that are required along the edges of the skin where I cut the case in half. I used my miter saw to cut the three eight-foot lengths down to the lengths necessary to comprise the uh, 12 sections of the frame. Here those pieces are laid out with the scrap strips on the left, but I've packed the uh, three different lengths so closely together in this photo they look like they're just one big piece of wood for each length. I use a 3 8 inch router bit in my router table to cut the um, mortises into the ends of um, the vertical pieces of the frame, as shown in these couple of pictures. Here all the vertical pieces have their mortises cut at both ends. In these couple of photos, I'm using my bandsaw to cut the tenons on the ends of the frame sections that are horizontal. And here are all those sections with their tenons. Here I'm doing a temporary test fit of the frame. Uh, there's no glue on it yet. I'm just trying to make sure all the pieces fit together, and I ended up with the desired size. Here are the instruments inside the temporarily lashed up frame and I'm just doing some blocking with pieces of wood and other things to put it in the position I designed it to fit in and make sure that everything is still good as a sanity check before I start gluing up the frame. Otherwise there's still time to make fixes. I used Gorilla Glue to glue the sections together uh, as usual, I have to apply moisture to one surface and glue to the other uh, in order to get the Gorilla Glue to react and foam out properly and then set. And uh, I use angles at all four or all three axes, vertical, horizontal, and depth, 
to make sure everything is square in all those dimensions. Here's the frame after gluing is complete. I still have to uh, clean up the foamed out glue on it. I've used a chisel to clean up the foamed out glue and now I've got the frame clamped to the uh, wing of my table saw so that I can route the uh, recesses for inlaying the side panels. Here's my router with the fence on it. Um, it's a large router, it's a little bit unwieldy, but it does work well for this. I use a three-quarter inch uh, bit in it, which is wide enough to do the job. After routing the uh, one side of one piece, I take a scrap of eighth-inch masonite or tempered hardboard and sit it in there to make sure I got the depth correct. The idea is to have the masonite ever so slightly recessed by just a, the thickness of a couple sheets of paper below the pine frame so that I can sand that down later to match the height of the uh, masonite side panels. For routing the ends of the case, I just set it on the floor and clamp it to the end of the table saw's wing so it doesn't rock around. Here's the frame with all sides routed for the inlay. Here I've cut all of the panels out of the eighth inch masonite in sizes perhaps an inch or so larger than they actually need to be and then I'll cut them down to precisely fit the frame. I trim each side panel to precisely fit its section. They're not necessarily interchangeable due to small variations and uh, for the process I used to do this you can watch one of my other videos. I didn't take pictures of it this time around. I use Gorilla Glue on the frame and then spritz water out of a spray bottle onto the back of the masonite so that the Gorilla Glue cures properly and I lay one panel in then I flip it over and lay the opposite panel in and then I can use beam clamps to uh, clamp those wait for the glue to dry and then do the um, opposing sides or the sides that are 90, 90 degrees around Here's the uh, box with all the sides glued on and the Gorilla Glue foams out of the seams. I use a chisel to scrape that down. I apply wood filler. Um, it's an epoxy wood filler, I think. Um, it's not the kind that's just sawdust mixed with um, wood glue. And I apply that to all the seams and then I sand the case down which removes excess wood filler and brings the level of the frame down to uh, match the masonite. You can see the um, red colored handheld belt sander I use for that process and I normally just lay the case on the floor to do the, the big sides but for the ends I use my uh, beam clamps to once again rest the case on end and clamp the uh, case to the table saw for stability. Now in this photo you can see that I have touched the masonite in some areas with the belt sander. I try not to do that but it's awfully hard uh, and if you it's a smooth surface and if you touch it ever so slightly it looks different like you can see in this picture but it's it's barely scuffed up. A fair amount of uh, sawdust is made from the sander. You can see where I've emptied the bag on the floor prior to vacuuming it up with my shop vac. Prior to putting on the primary coats of paint, I go over the entire thing with my um, vibrating sander. Um, I actually completed this sanding job with my orbital sander, which I just thought did a, a smoother job than uh, this little vibrating one although that's the one I've used on most of my cases in the past. Also prior to the primer coats of paint I get my two um, cheap box fans and tape on some 20 by 20 uh, furnace filters, just the cheapest one that the hardware stores have, just a few bucks a piece, uh, and these are to capture most of the overspray. 
I have the case resting on some cutoff bits of 2x4 just to get it up off the floor. I actually have another video on the risers I built about this same time to get things like this case up even higher. So you might want to watch that video if you're interested. For the primer, I use the Krylon Acrylic Quick Gray Primer Spray Paint. I typically put on two coats, then sand, then put on a third coat. This is the case with either one or two coats of primer on it. I'm not sure which. After the second coat of primer, I use my orbital sander with some 220 grit uh, sandpaper disc. And uh, there you can see my orbital sander standing on top of the case as I'm sanding the second coat. And here's the case after the third coat of primer is put on. I have mostly used the primer to A, prepare the wood for the finish coat, and B, to help fill in any scratch marks and things like that left from sanding the masonite. That's the, the biggest culprit for the finish. So um, working up several layers of the, the primer and then sanding between the second and third coats helps a lot. Here are a couple views of the case after the third coat of uh, third coat of primer is put on. Now I get my circular saw out and uh, cut the case between its lid and the body of the case. I use the circular saw for these bigger cases because I can't get the case up on the table saw, which I'd normally use otherwise. So here's with the, uh, the lid swung open from the body of the case, and I've made a couple of registration marks so I can always make sure that uh, when I proceed from this point that I know what the orientation of the lid is to the body of the case because it fits best that way. And uh, there's a view of the, the body of the case on the inside and another one of the lid of the case on the inside. This is the first time I've seen the inside of the case since I Gorilla glued the panels onto the frame and uh, because the Gorilla glue uh, foams out before hardening I use a chisel at this point just to quickly clear off the the excess glue because it gets in the way of uh, some other steps uh, as the case progresses. Most of the woodworking is done at this point. There's just some wood trim and some reinforcements that still need to be done. Again, we have the uh, body of the case and the lid of the case. Now that the case is all cleaned up, it's time to reinforce the edges. The masonite isn't strong enough along the cut edges. Uh, it would rapidly break, so it needs to have something along there to make it stronger, but it doesn't need to be as strong as the rest of the framework. Also, the reinforcement needs to be thick enough that it'll take screws for the valence, which will be added later, and the valence adds additional strength to the long sides. I cut down the remaining um, supposedly 2x2 two two piece of select pine into uh, 3 eighths of an inch thick strips and then cut them to length with the miter saw to fit both the top and the bottom halves of the case all four cut edges. I just used regular wood glue to glue all the reinforcing strips to the masonite edges and used my entire collection of spring clips and uh, mini uh, bar clamps to attach them as shown in these pictures. I use aluminum valence strips to reinforce the edges further and to assure alignment along the long edges. Uh, these are purchased from reliable hardware and they're sold in 12 foot lengths but they commonly cut them up at no charge into 4 foot lengths. You get 3 4 foot lengths if you order a 12 foot and stipulate that you want them cut. And uh, I use two of those uh, for each of these large cases and then cut them down to the desired length. Each of these extrusions is actually a top and bottom half of the valence. So once they've been cut to length, then I just uh, clamp them in a vise and break them along their, um, 
their pre-made, um, well, it's extruded, it's not machined, but it's a, a thin spot in the metal where if you just bend it back and forth a little bit, they just break cleanly in half. And then I drill holes in the flanges of the valences so that I can screw them to the, uh, the reinforcing strips on the case. Here are a few photos showing the valence strips attached to the case. Just uh, little sheet metal screws going into the reinforcing wood strips. I orient the uh, valence strip half that has the extended wedge part. I put that on the top part, and then the bottom part has the part with the trough that aligns with the top part. Does that make sense? Here's after the valence strips are added, I put the top of the case back on to check for good fit. One side lined up and the other side was, well, it had a bit of a gap as the second photo shows. I actually had to fix that by uh, lowering the valence strip. I had uh, put it on just a little bit too high so it didn't allow the case to close along that edge. Uh, that required that I... Um, drill new holes in the valence strip because I couldn't move it that small amount and still have the screw holes line up. Here are the other pieces of hardware that I bought from Reliable Hardware at the same time I bought the valence strips. On the left are two uh, handles. These are spring-loaded handles so they stay closed except when you pull them up and they are also recessed so they don't stick out from the case more than just a tiny amount. Uh, and next to those are two uh, latches, uh, also spring-loaded, uh, spring-loaded so that the latch part flips down and stays down until you actually latch it. And then they have butterfly clamps um, with uh, the whole assembly being recessed into the case. And then up above that are two keepers, which is what the latches hook onto on the lid. And then to the upper right are three so-called stop hinges. They don't allow the top to open more than 90 degrees. And then at the lower right, there are the corner reinforcers with built-in feet for the bottom of the case and corner reinforcers for the top part of the case. I put a little bit of masking tape on the case, spanning the lid and the body of the case in order to figure out exactly how high I'm going to put the latch and the keeper. I want the two sets of holes on the keeper to span the frame and the reinforcing strip more or less evenly and then have the, um, the latch itself still positioned low enough where the cutout in the masonite does not encroach on the um, reinforcing strip because I don't want to weaken that. And this shows a good location. And then the next photo shows... Um, where I just kind of eyeballed it to see how far left and right the latches should go. Here I'm just doing a little bit of a demonstration to show that although the case seems really big compared to the horn, it's not overly long or tall. And then uh, widthwise, it has to be wide enough to clear the bell and still have a couple inches on each side of the bell. And that defines the, uh, the depth of the case. For mounting the carrying handle, I like the cases to balance well. I know that front to rear, the weight is evenly distributed, but end to end it is not. The horns are decidedly heavier at one end than the other. And so I balance the cases. So with the horn in the case, I balance the case um, on a dowel or a piece of conduit or something round like that and just roll it back and forth with my fingers until the case evenly teeter-totters on it. And then I mark that position on the case for where I want to put the handle uh, lengthwise. I use a square to extend my mark to um, mark the top of the case where the handle is going to go. The other thing I offset regarding the top handle is that if I orient the handle plate centered front to rear when the handle is actually folded up the case is no longer centered relative to where the handle actually is when folded up so I'll offset it in the front to rear direction as well. 
for the latches, they need to have reinforcement because you can't mount the latches into masonite itself. It won't take the hardware. Uh, so for this purpose, I usually use quarter-inch craft plywood, and here I've marked a sheet, which I buy from the local Ace Hardware in, um, I think they're one by two foot pieces. They stock that, and then cut it in half on the table saw. For uh, reinforcing the way that the um, backing plates for the latches go in, I like to, on one end at least, um, cut into the framework a little bit with a quarter inch milling bit and my Dremel tool and I use the flex shaft so that I can get in there a little better uh, and then that gives me a place where I can slide one end of the plywood into and I actually epoxy it into that position in most instances but on this case I think I used wood glue for that. I used more of the select pine to make some support rails for the hinges and I put uh, tenons on the ends or on one end and then um, recessed that into the frame once again hogging it out with the Dremel tool. The other end of the support rail um, just attaches to the reinforcing strip uh, using a rabbit joint and I use wood glue for this. Here I'm just using some various weights to hold down the hinge reinforcing strips while the glue dries. I use some masking tape to mark out where I'm going to cut the holes for the recessed latches and also on the end of the case for the recessed handle and not shown in the photo is a similar tape up arrangement for the cutout for the recess for the handle on the lid. I used my jigsaw to cut out the holes for the latches and for the end handle and for the top handle. There is no requirement for additional reinforcement for the latches or the hinges. Those are already in there, but the handles uh, will require some additional help. For the carrying handle on the lid of the case, I just put in some scraps of that select pine um, and would glue them in place everywhere where there's going to be a screw from the uh, handle mounting plate. And because I'm just butt jointing the, the longer sections to the frame, I put in a couple, well, four extra little blocks of wood that are uh, just epoxied in place later on to provide a little more strength for passing uh, the the load of the case through the carrying handle through those um, reinforcing stringers and out to the frame so that the masonite doesn't take the whole load. I did something a bit similar on the uh, the end handle except in this case uh, I notched in with tenons into mortises cut with the Dremel tool into the bottom frame and then just as I did with the hinge reinforcing strips I uh, rabbited the top into the um, the reinforcing strip along the top edge and then I put on the cross pieces which are just epoxied in place on the ends uh, and then um, just wood glue um, to the masonite. I use the epoxy selectively. It's a pain in the neck to mix up little batches over and over so I don't like using it for large areas, but it's, I think, stronger than the wood glue in, in those select areas, especially where I have butt joints and things like that. Now, the bell end of the case is going to have a big foam block um, setting the, the bell away from the, the wall of the case. And usually I would do something similar at the tail end. In other words, the end of the case in this instance that has the, the pull handle on it. Uh, but it's so much work to cut out the foam and notch it. It's bad enough on the other end where it's a simple frame, but on the, the uh, end with the handle, I have to cut so much out of the foam block to fit around the stringers for the handle that it's just not worth it, I think. I decided to try something a little different in this instance, and it is part of the design, not a, not a last-minute um, improvisation. Um, I decided to put a plywood sheet 
uh, along that tail end there and just completely cover up the reinforcing wood for the pull handle. And to that end, I wanted to disguise the top edge of it. I don't like having the edges of the plywood exposed anywhere. So uh, I made this little piece of scrap wood that the top of the plywood will notch into and it'll make it more decorative and less likely when people are putting their hands into the case that they're going to get a splinter from the edge of the plywood or something like that. A little wood glue and some clamps to hold the decorative piece in place and then glue the plywood in and notice how the, the end facing us is stuck into that um, relief in the, um, the decorative piece. It's time to put on the final color coat and to that end I've masked off all the openings for the handles and the latches with in this case blue masking tape and uh, for painting the these final color coats instead of using the little pieces of 2 by 4 by this time in the project I had my risers made that I did a separate video on so now I'm going to use those. For this I'm going to use the blue paint on top of the gray primer paint and uh, here's the label for that. I make cases for my own instruments as well as cases for other people, friends and so on who are instrument collectors. But uh, this series of videos I've been doing are all for cases for the same organization and uh, they're color for cases is this true blue or OSHA safety blue. It's a distinctive color that nobody else seems to use for cases and when they get taken off the truck after being moved around and so on or especially if they're used for a performance they could be stuck anywhere backstage is whatever and the color being distinctive and it just jumps out from the background it makes it easy to spot cases that might be left behind or something like that by accident or if somebody takes off with one you know, nothing else looks like that. You're carrying a blue case around and it looks suspicious. So um, here's after the first coat. I put on three coats just like I did with the primer um, to have a nice thick layer of paint. And uh, you can see I've got the box fans with a new set of filters this time. I'm not reusing the ones for the gray paint. And the case is sitting up on the risers I built. Um, it's starting to look pretty decent. Next I used my Dremel tool on all corners of the case to lop off the corners so that the stamped corner protectors will fit over it. They won't go on properly if, they have a sh if you have a sharp corner on the wood. And then uh, also because of the stamped metal it won't go around the sharp edge corners so um, I have to take those down too. That area I take it off will be covered up by the, the metal corners. And uh, I switched from the sanding drum, which I just used on a whim, it instantly clogs with paint, uh, to the milling bit, which worked a whole lot better. And that's what I usually use anyhow. I mark the locations for the three holes required for each of the corners and do a pilot hole with my electric drill so the screw is going real nice. So the bottom of the case is facing up here and I put on the first of the corners. You can see how that goes on. It has the um, bump on there which acts like a foot for the case. So there are the corner protectors on the bottom of the case and uh, the corner protectors on the top lid of the case. Next the handles go on. That's the top handle and that's what it looks like from the inside and then the uh, the end pull handle. Next up are the hinges. I use some uh, beam clamps to make sure the case is as tight together as it'll go and then put in the screws and uh, there it looks good. The stop hinges keep the lid from opening more than that and that's what it looks like opened up with the hinges in place. On the hinges by the way um, the screws that are closest to the hinge point they actually go into the valences through the trim strips while the other screws that are further away from the hinge point go into the frame. So there's two very strong things there into which the 
the screws can go from the hinges. The difference is that I can use sheet metal screws into the wood frame, but where it's going to go through into the valence, I need to use machine screws and drill and tap through into the valence so it'll anchor there. That's not shown clearly in these pictures. Then the latches go on, again with sheet metal screws going through the masonite and into the reinforcing wood uh, plywood behind them. Something else I failed to mention thus far is that all these pieces I've used from Reliable Hardware go in with number eight screws, either sheet metal screws or machine screws, depending on what the screws are going into. Uh, the, the number eight fits the, the holes just about precisely, so they're not going to be loose on there. But the next step will involve the keepers, and those take number 10 screws. Now for the keepers, uh, there's two screws into the frame and two screws into the uh, edge strip reinforcing. Uh, and there's a bit of a trick to this. The way I do it is I use the butterfly knob to make sure the latch is in the closed position so it's pulling down. Then I hook the latch into the keeper. I pull the keeper as far away from the latch as possible and hold it tightly in position while I turn the butterfly knob on the latch to release it, get that out of the way, and then I move the keeper about one sixteenth of an inch further away yet again from the latch. Uh, that forces the spring in the, in the latch to pull tighter so it really holds the case shut firmly. And because I'm using the number 10 screws that precisely fit the holes in the keeper, it's not going to go anywhere. Okay, both latches and their keepers are in place, and here's the case up to this point. Except for the blocking, it's basically done. Marvel at its glory. Putting the horn back in for another sanity check and demonstration of the fit. With the bell about two inches from the bell end of the case, the, um, the bottom bow and its reinforcing strip come almost in contact with that plywood plate I have at the tail end, but it doesn't quite touch. Okay, time to put in the foam blocking. The foam I use comes from my stash of uh, two pound, that's the density, two pound closed cell chemically cross-linked polyethylene foam. I consider this to be the ideal material for cases of this sort. It's firm, it can be machined almost like if it was balsa wood or something, but yet it compresses, it has a good memory to it because of the closed cell nature, unlike something like foam rubber, which is open cell. And uh, it does not react with anything, it won't absorb anything, it is permanent, it won't decompose over time. Uh, it's very good for this kind of application, I've never found anything that works better. So I start with the largest block, that's the one that protects the, uh, the face of the bell and holds the instrument in the case on that end. Um, I just start whittling away at it with progressive cuts on the table saw and some on the band saw and uh, just eventually cut away at a block of it until it fits in amongst the, the frame and the reinforcing stringers and everything on that end of the case. The bell is going to sit on something, and I changed my mind with how I was going to do this to keep the bell from slipping in between the first block and the block it's sitting on. I cut off a chunk of the main block and then slipped another piece under it. Uh, it just works out better that way. And then two more similar blocks are put on the front and rear to hold the bell in in that direction. And once again, they're cut to fit against as many frame members as possible because the polyethylene foam does not glue all that strongly. I don't want the pieces falling off with use. So by wedging them in with as many surface contact points as possible with the case, it just makes the glue joint or the, the many glue joints stronger in the, in the aggregate. Now I use progressive blocks to jack up the tail end of the horn until the bell is almost flat against its foam block. I don't want it precisely flat against it because then there's too much friction 
putting the uh, horn in and out of the case. I want the bottom up against the block, but I want the top to be just a, you know, uh, a sixteenth of an inch or something away from the block so that it slides out easier. With the horn blocked up like that, I have to do a sanity check to make sure that the lid will still close, that I didn't miscalculate somewhere. And there's also that finger hook on there which is sticking up. I need to make sure that's got at least, you know, maybe a half of an inch clearance or something like that between that and the top of the case. Up to this point I've been using two inch thick foam but for the block that's going to support the tail end of the horn, I use a three inch block and just whittle away at it till it fits the horn and the case. I mostly use the bandsaw for this except for the, the outer periphery. Since this is a long instrument and a fairly slender one, I make a central uh, pillow block in the same manner. Now just a little bit of a foam block to pad out the tail end of the horn where it meets the plywood. It's just a thin piece of foam and I use the table saw to cut a slot in it for the uh, reinforcing ridge on the bottom bow and then that fits up against the plywood. Now a foam block on the lid of the case is calculated to come down and hold the top of the bell rim firmly in position at that end of the case. And then the last piece of foam goes on over the tail pillow block and just touches the horn right next to the finger hook and making sure it doesn't tend to rise up out of there in transit, especially if the case gets tipped over or dropped upside down or something like that. I use any of several different liquid nails construction adhesive formulas and uh, I apply it fairly liberally and on all surfaces where the foam will touch the case. Okay, all the foam blocking is glued in place. Ready to put the horn and make sure it still fits. And there it fits in cozy as a bug in a rug. All of my cases have a box et inside of them to hold a mouthpiece, valve oil, slide grease, that type of thing. And I use some leftover quarter inch craft plywood. I've cut all I've marked all the pieces here for cutting. I do a test fit of the pieces here, and there's with the lid laid on. I haven't cut the lid into the two pieces yet, it'll finally have. But notice how the lid overhangs quite a bit. That's because a feature of my case is that the box set cannot physically come open. It's an impossibility while the horn is in the case. And this way there's no chance in transit of the, especially the heavy mouthpiece coming out and knocking around. If a box is held shut with a latch or Velcro or something, there's still a fair chance that, uh, especially with rough handling, the mouthpiece will escape and bounce around inside. So by having part of the cover of the case fit under the instrument when the instrument is in the case, it prevents that eventuality from happening. Here the lid of the, of the box set has been cut. There's about a one inch wide strip on the right. That'll be glued to the case and then a couple little brass hinges from the hardware store and a wooden knob from the hardware store. You don't really need a knob on these because you can just reach under the plywood and pull it up, but I like to put it on there anyway. So the um, right panel of the box set is liquid nailed to the foam and epoxied everywhere where it touches the wood of the case or the masonite. And then the other panels of the, the sides are epoxied in place to each other and to the case. I use epoxy here instead of wood glue because um, I use it liberally and wood glue would just run and make a puddle in the bottom of the case where the epoxy tends to stay put a little better. I want to have plenty of strength on these joints and I think epoxy is just superior to wood glue in this kind of situation. Once again epoxy is used to join that back strip of the cover to the masonite, to the rest of the wood, to everything where there's a contact point. To protect the instrument from contact from the wood, although it wouldn't really do it any damage, it can't dent it or anything, uh, I usually put a thin strip of the foam, but in this instance 
I made the clearance minimal and I just used a strip of felt that I put on with uh, rubber cement and that'll protect against any possible scratching or marring of the brass from uh, touching that case lid. I lay a metal straight edge along the bottom of the two pillow blocks. This represents the bottom edge of the horn in this area and I verify that it almost but doesn't quite touch the top of the felt so the clearance has worked out perfectly here. Here are a few views of the finished box set. Here I've given it a coat of varnish so it's being propped open with a popsicle stick. The varnish is there in case valve oil or slide grease leaks out that it won't soak into the masonite. That's the main reason. If it soaks into the masonite, it weakens the masonite and can also cause the paint to come off if it soaks in deep enough. So the polyurethane varnish protects against that. I use my brother P-Touch software uh, to design a label. Um, the organization that owns the instrument and the case uh, has serial numbers for all of their cases. And um, this is a three-quarter inch wide label. Um, and I'm using the, e, um, the TZ series tape, which is more durable, and it has an extra layer of plastic over the, the text so it can't be scraped off. And it also has a much more aggressive adhesive. The owner of the instrument and case has a serial number system for the instruments as well. And uh, it's a three-digit, usually, code, where the first digit stipulates the size of the instrument, with one being an E-flat uh, cornet, a two being a B-flat cornet, a three being an E-flat alto, and a four being a B-flat tenor. 5 is a B-flat baritone or B-flat bass, and 5 is a E-flat bass, which is the lowest instrument of its type. The second digit, a 1 in this instance, tells you what the form factor of the instrument is. So a 1 is an over-the-shoulder instrument. 2s, 3s, and 4s variously represent, uh, for example, uh, bell up instrument, bell forward instrument, or helical uh, instrument. The letter suffix just indicates the order of acquisition and uh, in this instance represents the twelfth example in the collection of a 41 pitch and configuration instrument. However, if an instrument gets retired, sold, traded, or disposed of in any way, then um, its number is not reused. So just the fact that an L represents the 12th instrument of this type doesn't mean the collection still has 12 instruments of that. It, it's meaningless in that regard. But the records are like um, a star quarterbacks or something jersey number. They're not retired. I take my brass stencil and masking tape it into a cutout in a piece of craft paper masking material. The paint I use for the serial numbers is the third one in this set, and here's the label. It's just the Krylon uh, Acrylic Quick Gloss White. And here's a larger piece of masking uh, paper um, for the larger sides of the case, the top, and the front and the rear. The bottom of the case doesn't get a, a stencil. So the case is completed, and here's what it looks like. and with the happy, protected, and comfortable horn inside of it. Here is a case that I brought to my home shop, and uh, these were some older cases. I've been building cases for the organization for something like 16 years. But before that, they had somebody else build cases, and these are well-built cases, but they usually had very bad hardware on them. The woodwork was fine. Also, they weren't well padded. The, the guy was a woodworker, a cabinet maker, and he didn't really know about the, the road case hardware that's available. He just used little 
undersized brass pieces from the hardware store that got smacked up and ruined. So I refitted quite a few of the cases in addition to building new ones and put on much better hardware. Um, and I also reblocked the cases. So here's the reblocking I did for this instrument. Now this is 43N, so 40 again means it's a B flat tenor, and the 3 means it's a bell up instrument. I also repaired the box set that was built by the other guy. I put a knob on it and I fixed the uh, hard or the the hardware. This one um, could not be held shut the way I usually do it, so I just used uh, a different technique.